Hello, Sharon. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to have this interview about ARDD and life beyond sciences. This, this time I really appreciate it and thank you so much for sponsoring the conference as a returning sponsor. That means that there must be something about ARDD that just keeps attracting you for the good memories, opportunities and hopefully the knowledge that you could share at the conference. So thank you for that. And could we start with a little bit of an introduction to life biosciences? What is your science and what are your biggest milestones this year or in the years forward? So first, I thank you for uh, inviting me to talk to you today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing at LIFE and uh, the excitement we have about coming to the ARDD conference um, this summer. So at LIFE Biosciences, um, we are a cellular rejuvenation company. So we really focus on the premise that aging is not a result of just normal wear and tear on the body, but rather that there are biological processes that are underlying aging and that we have the ability now through the science that's been developed to address these underlying biologies of aging. Um, in Life Bio, we really focus on health span. So we wanna expand the number of healthy years as people age. And so that's really where we focus our attention and what is important to us. We focus on a lot of diseases related to age, age sorry, a lot of age related diseases. So we're focused on a number of different organ systems that allow us to address aging across the body. Um, wow, okay. Yeah. Please go so, on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have two main platforms focused on cellular rejuvenation. One is a, a partial epigenetic reprogramming that we use, as well as we have a chaperone-mediated autophagy program. So epigenetic reprogramming focuses on the DNA modifications that occur to DNA uh, on DNA, so methylate, DNA methylation, whereas that occurs during aging, whereas our CMA focus focuses on the loss of proteostasis and the ability to restore that normal uh, proteostasis. So the first thing that comes to my mind when I hear cellular reprogramming is Yamanaka factors. Are you using them or could you speak a little bit more about how exactly are you attempting this, uh, this quest? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're building on the Yamanaka factors and the work that was done. Um, so the Yamanaka factors, there are four factors, OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, CMYK, all of which when used together can take a mature or injured cell and turn it all the way back to a pluripotent stem cell. What we're doing is we're building on the work of Dr. David Sinclair, where he identified that you only need three of the Yamanaka factors, OF4, SOX2, and KLF4, which allows you to not take us all the way back to a stem cell state, but rather to make a more youthful version of itself. So in doing so, we maintain the cellular identity. So a retinal ganglion cell, for example, stays a retinal ganglion cell, a lung cell stays a lung cell, a heart cell stays a heart cell. And we think that's really important to the process that we're addressing. And importantly, we have the ability to show that you can still uh, improve aging, you know, get to a more useful and more resilient state of the cell. So um, it's quite an exciting field to be in. And so we're using those three factors. So we do it in a, in our version of it is an ER100. So ER100 is a two vector system. Okay, so we have two vectors and it allows us to use a Teton DOX inducible system. Short, at, short form it means we can control it, okay? When we administer a, the AAV with OSK, we can turn it on or off based on whether or not doxycycline is present. Wow, okay, I will definitely put it all in the show notes for people to get fully into the science and link the papers. So I took a look at the website and you're now in a preclinical stage, right? How, how is it in the stage of approval? What, how does the research look like at this moment? And we're really excited about where we are right now because we are hoping to be in the clinic in 2025. So we're doing those. Wow. Yeah, so it's an exciting time. We're focusing on uh, optic neuropathies. So we're focusing on glaucoma and nion. Nion is non-arboritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So uh, people may be more familiar with glaucoma, but nion is gaining some attention right now. Uh, but basically what nion is, is it's just like a stroke of the eye. You go to sleep at night, wake up the next morning, you've lost much of the vision in one of your eyes. 
it's acute, it's painless, um, and there are no current tre effective treatments for NION. So we think it's a really important area of research to be in, an area of you know clinical development. Um, and it's gained like a lot of attention in the last few weeks because there's a, a, a paper that came out in JAMA demonstrating that there is an association with the use of the anti-OPCD, anti-diabetes drugs such as Ozempic or Wegovy. Um, and so there's you know a, a unmet need for NION that is really critical right now. Wow, and especially given how the weight loss drugs, the GLP-1 inhibitors are popular in the longevity ecosystem right now, that's, that's another point for getting your science to the clinic as soon as possible to get exactly. the results back. Exactly. Now, they're important drugs, and they're important drugs for treating, you know, obesity, diabetes, you know, as you said, in the age-related diseases. And so it's important that we, you know, find ways to address these concerns. Definitely. This might be a bit of a specific question, but how uh, common is nylon in the population, roughly speaking? It's 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 small. You know, like fifteen to twenty five thousand, I think, a year. I, I may be slightly wrong on those numbers, but uh, but it's it's a small number. Um, but the paper that just came out showed that the risks are increasing. You know, four to seven fold in people with diabetes and obesity. Four to seven folds. That's that's a huge increase. Okay, I will definitely link the paper in the show notes of, the, of this interview. Okay, so coming back a little bit to uh, to the goal uh, or actually the plan to get clinical next year, what kind of partnerships would you need, or what kind of help would you appreciate the most to make this process smooth and and as obtainable as possible for from external parties that you could potentially meet at ARDD if possible. So in other words, if any researcher, student or professor is listening to this right now and wants to approach you to help achieve the, the big goal and, and hopefully in the long run, bring it to the market, who are you interested to in speaking to? We're interested in everybody, right? We're interested in hearing from students who could potentially become interns with us next summer. We're interested in hearing from potential collaborators who could help us advance our science um, and move our programs forward. And we're obviously interested in potential partnerships and who can work with us to bring these uh, therapeutics to the field as soon as possible. Okay, so that's a big message for everybody who is coming to ARDD, which is happening in a month and one day, which is very exciting. Sharon, are you coming personally to Copenhagen? I am coming personally to Copenhagen. Yay, that's wonderful. That's exciting. I can't wait for that. So so if I uh, assume correctly, you're going to give a speech, a lecture, right? Yes, I am giving a talk at ARGD. I'm very excited about that. Wonderful. Could you give us a little bit of a sneak peek on what are you going to talk about? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to continue to talk about the work that we're doing, demonstrating that ER100 is effective in a non-human primate model of NION. So we, we talked a little bit last year about that. I'm gonna extend what I spoke about last year to give a little bit more information about what we've, we're learning about the fact that uh, AR100 improves uh, pattern ERG, which is an, an indication of um, visual function, that we can improve axon density, um, you know, and that we can uh, demonstrate that you know, OSK is reaching you know, the um, retinal ganglion cells. So I'm excited about just sharing where we've gone with the work and where it continues to go. Fascinating. I can't wait for that. And I will link the uh, your, your lecture from last year in the show notes too, so, so that people come prepared, you know, with, uh, with a little bit more of a background. So this is very exciting what you are telling me right now about this research. And as a chief scientific officer, I would be very curious to know your path towards ending up here. And so what's your, what's your background? What's your story? So my background, you know, I think I have an interesting uh, background because people often, you know, start their career in one space and, you know, stay there a, a long time. I, I've kind of done a lot of different things in my career. So I started uh, uh, getting my PhD in psychology or behavioral neuroscience um, at Harvard. And then I went on to do a postdoc in industry. So that's, you know, already not a usual step back in my day, maybe a little bit more common now. Um, and so I started working at American Cyanamid, 
Um, and so now you have to sort of follow the bouncing ball a little bit. American Cyanamid was acquired by American Home Products, which renamed itself Wyeth, which was acquired by Pfizer. So over an 18 year period, I worked in the neuroscience group doing everything from working on early exploratory programs up through having led a team through a successful phase two proof of concept study in schizophrenia. Late congratulations on that. Thank you. Towards the end of my tenure there, I actually became of the head of the translational neuroscience group. So bridging the work that we were doing in discovery with the work that we were doing in early clinical development. Um, after, uh, when I left Pfizer, I went on to a consulting career. So I, for the next 12 years, I did a, a whole bunch of consulting, including for a company called Aegean Bio, where I served as their VP of research and development. And there I was able to work on everything from uh, develop a new discovery program to completing a phase 2B clinical trial for the treatment of mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. So, and importantly, the work that we were doing at Aging Bio was based on aging biology. So it begins my forays into the specifics of aging biology. Um, and in each of these places, the skills that I learned grew. So I learned, you know, everything from exploratory all the way through moving a product into clinical development while I was at Wyeth. And then as I was at Aging Bio, I had to learn about formulation development, about clinical strategy, about moving, you know, continuing to move things forward, regulatory strategy. Um, and I'm excited to bring a lot of that now to what I'm doing at Life Biosciences. So at Life Biosciences, I moved slightly out of my comfort zone. So instead of being purely neuroscience, we've now moved into neuro-ophthalmology. So I'm not completely outside the zone, but I've learned a lot about ophthalmology. Um, and in all of these places, learn the leadership skills. You learn the importance of how you work with people, how you develop the science, how you move things forward. And so that's really, you know, the opportunities that you get along the way. So as you move along the way, you know, it's important to gain all of those skills and to keep following the things that are interesting to you. That's where my career took me. I just kept following things that were fun and exciting and new, learning something new all the time. If I could have a billboard, I would definitely put it so if what you just said to just follow what interests you, because so many people just get stuck on thinking that they need to master the expertise in just one thing, losing the interest along the path. And that's a very sad thing that is happening. And you're just an inspiration showing that this path can be diverse. And by this diversity, we can actually gain more than we ever expected to gain. Right. Absolutely. It's really important. You know? And I think by having these different experiences, you bring different things to the table in the conversations, and that, that's important too. Of course, and the conversations itself, like I, we couldn't under uh, or just overstate how important are the connections and just the conversations with people. Because even from a simple conversation, uh, just during the coffee break at the con uh, at the conference an idea for a startup or some unexplored research theory, uh, theory can can come up. And this uh, is what excites me. And, and that's, how, that's how research collaborations are built. You know, with these coffee, as you said, coffee break moments where you start to talk about something and you're like, you know what we can do together? And then, you know, the excitement builds and opportunities build. And that's, you know, you build the relationships, you build the excitement, you build the shared common interest, and you're able to move it, move science forward and move programs forward. Exactly. And I am very excited to hearing as much of well, you know what we can do together at this ARDV. So hopefully we could we could see the fruits of this collaboration very soon after the conference. You know what? So we, we learned so much at ARDD. You know, the diversity of the science that's being presented, the opportunities that you hear about. You know, so as much as we're interested in collaborating on ours, we're we're interested in learning about what everybody else is doing and ARDD really covers a wide swath of what's being done in the aging field. And so it's a great place to learn about it. Thank you so much for saying this. Well, it takes fifty six weeks to to organize, but of course, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be possible without all the wonderful researchers and sponsors and entrepreneurs that are coming. So it's all in the people. It's all in the conversations and lectures. So speaking of ARDT, for a second more, I know that you are a returning returning sponsor, returning lecturer. Do you have any memory that that just pops up at the top of the brain uh, when you hear ARDT? So last year was the first time I attended ARDD. Um, and I was fairly new to 
the aging field beyond what was happening in neuroscience, right? So I knew what was going on in the neuroscience world, but beyond that, this was still new to me. And it was just eye-opening, the incredible science, the incredible people I met, um, the relationships, you know, just building relationships. And, you know, since then I see people at other meetings. And so it's really that opportunity to connect with people, connect with industry people, to connect with ac people in academia, to connect with students, because, you know, that's where it's going. You know, that's, those are your next collaborators. Um, and so really that opportunity to connect with everybody, to learn from everybody, you know, was incredible. And so last year, that's what really stood out to me was just the awe of what was being presented and, and who was being brought together for this forum. Wow, I'm more than happy to hear that. And I hope that this year ARDD can even exceed the feeding from, from last year. We'll, well definitely I'm make sure that- i all those relationships that I started last year. So I'm excited about it. Well, then I am excited with you. Thank you so much for saying this. And I will uh, stick a little bit more to one topic that you just mentioned, and that is students. There are going to be a lot of students at ARDT. And if you could give a piece of advice based on your experience, your career trajectory, and just what you're observing in the field right now, what would you tell them? So I think I started to say it before, you, you got to follow your passion. Okay, follow your interests. You know, if you start to work on something, follow it through, keep going with it. You know, even if it moves beyond where you are, move with it. You know, that's what I did in my career. Um, I think it's really important to stay in the translational space. So really understand what you're doing and how that's going to apply to what's happening in the clinic. Um, don't be afraid of biotech and industry. We need you, okay? We need students to be moving into that space because all these great scientific advancements don't make it all the way through to the clinic and to the market unless we have people in biotech and industry who are developing this, that have the skills to advance them and follow them through the regulatory pathways and get them to market. So it's really important to look at the entire spectrum of what's out there in the field and really decide where you can make your best mark, where you can have your most impact and to follow it through. But it's really important to continue to just follow your interest, your science, your passion, and keep going with it. Exactly. And one more piece of advice is to follow amazing role models from which you can learn more than, than you could possibly imagine. And role models just like you, Sharon, they, everybody can meet at uh, ARDD. And through research publications, I would also highly encourage everybody to just reach out to people through various social media channels and, and emails if possible because that opens up to possible ways of connecting and you, you never lose by sending this email, the cold email, so-called. Absolutely. So Sharon, with this, I would like to, with this uplifted spirit, I would like to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and I learned so much. I will list it all down on the show notes for everybody to just have a rundown of what we are talking uh, through. And I can't wait to see you at ARDD and can't wait to listen more about the advancements of life biosciences. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you as well.